And I'd love to take this opportunity to introduce, um, while we're bringing up her slides, our next speaker, um, Dr. Marina Kasky is from Weill Cornell Medical School. She's a professor of clinical investigation at Rockefeller University. She, her work has focused on the development and clinical evaluation of novel immunotherapeutic strat strategies aimed at infectious diseases with a special emphasis on HIV. Dr. Kasky has led a series of early phase clinical trials to evaluate the safety and efficacy of broadly neutralizing anti-HIV antibodies. These antibodies are now considered one of the most promising strategies to achieve HIV remission, as well as potential alternatives to antiretroviral therapy for both treatment and prevention. She has recently extended her focus to the novel SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus and is working to discover and characterize broadly neutralizing antibodies that may be effective against COVID-19. She's also an attending physician in infectious diseases at Weill Cornell Medicine and a member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation. She will be talking to us this morning about anti-HIV-1 broadly neutralizing antibodies and their potential clinical applications. Dr. Kasky. Okay, thank you very much for the, the kind introduction and the, the opportunity to talk about HIV BNABs to this um, audience today. Uh, here are my disclosures. Um, and in the next uh, 30 minutes, I'm going to try to talk to you about the potential indications um, of these HIV BNABs, um, and as well as describe uh, engineering uh, modifications that have been done in, for some of these antibodies, as well as an update of uh, data that we have generated uh, as a field uh, in early clinical trials. So um, just to, to start, the idea of using um, antibodies or passive immunization uh, against infectious diseases is something that, that is not new. Uh, it's been around for over 100 years uh, with uh, diphtheria antitoxin. But it was really in the uh, late 80s uh, when generating monoclonal antibodies, uh, we had the, the, the technology to do so, that monoclonals um, began to, to be part of um, clinical medicine. Um, and in HIV and infectious diseases in particular, uh, this work was accelerated in the, the middle uh, to late uh, 2000s um, when uh, new methods were developed to, to isolate uh, single B cells and then from those uh, characterize and identify um, antibodies with great potency. And since uh, COVID-19, we really saw an acceleration of monoclonals coming to clinical practice. Um, but what I like to, to remind ourselves is that the, um, the HIV field played a, a key role, uh, in my opinion, in, in what we saw with the SARS-CoV-2 monoclonals, uh, because a lot of these cloning methods, so the discovery of the antibodies, had evolved uh, under the umbrella of HIV uh, research, uh, where we were able to develop assays to characterize uh, activity, specificity, and also uh, design and apply modifications to these antibodies to make them either uh, have be longer lived or have enhanced uh, function. And then we return um, SARS-CoV-2 application of various um, antibodies uh, over the last uh, three years uh, generated a lot of safety data uh, of monoclonals against an infectious agent. And then we also learned that there is a way uh, to fast development and also fast deployment of monoclonals as a tool uh, against infectious diseases. Uh, however, you know, the, even though uh, BNABs uh, have been um, researched now for, for over 10 years, uh, the HIV envelope is, is a particularly challenging target, um, and that comes from three specific uh, characteristics of, it, of the envelope. Uh, first of all, unlike SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses, envelope is only sparsely expressed on the surface of the virus, so there are few targets for antibodies. And not only that, these are, are masked by a, a complex and thick shield of glycans, besides being highly diverse, way more so than SARS-CoV-2 is. However, despite these challenges, during HIV infection, between this interplay uh, of viral evolution and immune response evolution, a, a, a subset of individuals living with HIV go on to develop what we call BNABs, which are antibodies that have activity against different HIV clades. So with these tools in hand, the field has been asking the question, can these BNABs have a role in HIV infection? 
So uh, here, what I'm uh, illustrating is the envelope trimer, which is the target to these to the BNABs. Um, and the colored areas uh, show the, the different epitopes that are that have been described as being susceptible to neutralization. And these various letters and numbers um, are antibodies that are in clinical evaluation and that, that target um, these different areas of the HIV envelope. And in addition to these uh, naturally occurring um, antibodies, there there are antibodies that have there are bispecific, tri-specific, and also being delivered through. Um, through uh, viral vectors. Uh, so what, what's special about uh, these antibodies? What this uh, figure here is showing is a heat map where um, viruses of different HIV clades, so here C, B, and clade AE, were tested in vitro to see how sensitive or not they were to different um, BNABs here in this column to the left. Um, and the, the BNABs are then characterized according to the area of the envelope that they recognize. The, the redder the color, it means the more sensitive the viruses are, green or white means that there is no sensitivity. And what I highlighted here is just to illustrate that even though these antibodies, so V2-lip antibodies are very broad in general. However, against clade B, which is the main clade circulating in the United States, for example, uh, it doesn't have uh, great activity. Um, same is true for V3 antibodies in viruses that circulate in Thailand. So, so this serves to illustrate that like ARVs, it's likely that the use of antibodies will have to be in combination. And then if we look at that at an individual level, uh, we also know that greater envelope diversity, so as the virus evolves before uh, ART is initiated, is associated with greater neutralization titers, greater antibody responses. However, in this process, there is selection of resistance even to some of these BNABs. So um, with all of these caveats and, and, and tools now in hand, um, these are the, the areas that BNABs are being uh, evaluated clinically. So they are being considered as long-acting alternatives or adjuncts to ARVs um, for, for different reasons. One, as a class, antibodies are considered to be safe, and then we have experienced this with SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. And I think it's an important point that they, they don't carry the risk of selecting for ARV resistance, even the long-acting ones that will be followed by a period of long decay uh, and washout. Uh, antibodies have inherently long half-lives, and these can be prolonged even to up to three months, which will probably allow administration, very infrequent administration. And in addition to that, this is more on the, the research further from the clinic side, uh, but they do, uh, they carry the potential to be tools in treatment-free remission. And that is because not only do they bind to envelope, but they also through their FC domains, they can interact with the rest of the immune system. And then by doing so, they, they have the potential to target infected cells um, that carry HIV or improve, uh, modulate existing immune responses. So what have we learned so far from the various clinical studies? So uh, the AIM studies, which I'm sure that most of you are familiar with, were two uh, parallel phase 2B studies of VRCO1, which is a CD4 binding, um, binding site antibody. Uh, they were conducted in the Americas and uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then this is the, the, the key figure from, from the paper that shows that even though overall the, um, the antibody did not reach the F a C endpoint uh, against viruses that were highly sensitive to the antibodies, uh, efficacy reached 75%, um, eff prevention efficacy reached 75%. So even though the study as a whole wasn't a success, uh, it, it did prove the concept that prevention can in fact be achieved by BNAB administration. And it's important to note that it's this was regardless of gender or region specific clade, uh, since the, the, um, the studies happened in two different um, areas of the world. However, it's highly dependent on neutralization sensitivity. And in this case, only 30% of the viruses happen to be sensitive to VRCO1 and required higher levels of antibodies than had been anticipated. And then the other pieces that are important and more for on the lab side is that we learned that in vitro neutralization assays can be predictive and in, 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 in therefore be important tools to select antibodies for future studies. And then we, they also identified a biomarker of prevention efficacy. But when we look at these results as a whole, uh, should we look at this as a, as a glass half full or half empty? Uh, what are the next steps uh, after AMP results? And the questions are, 
you know, will combinations of VNAPs provide greater protection? We expect that yes, but the reality is we don't know how many antibodies would be needed and then which ones would be the best combination. Uh, we also don't have a great sense of the dose level and frequency of the administration um, to achieve protection titers when we are thinking about other antibody and antibody combinations. And then a bigger question that, that, that uh, lab researchers are trying to address in the meantime, has resistance started to evolve against these BNABs on a population level? Uh, and then therefore, will we need then to always be in the search for novel, um, better uh, antibodies? So now if we turn to what we have learned in studies with HIV infection, a series of studies have been done um, in uh, individuals with um, that had ongoing viremia who had not been on ART. Uh, these studies have tested either a single antibody, a combination of two antibodies, or even a combination of three antibodies targeting different areas of envelope. And what we've learned across all of these studies is that uh, even though they are BNABs, they are broad in vitro, uh, there was always across the studies a subset of individuals that had baseline resistance uh, to the antibodies, which is probably not to, to not great surprise since these antibodies were isolated with, from people with HIV and, and co-evolved with uh, the virus. Um, however, despite resistance, um, in individuals that had sensitivity to the antibodies, we did see uh, direct antiviral activity where there was reduction in viremia. However, that was followed by rebound with selection of resistance, and that was the case even when, when three antibodies were given. Although it was also important to note that resistance to the CD4 binding site antibodies is not readily selected as for some of the other targets. Um, these antibodies have been modified, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in their FC domain uh, by two simple mutations that uh, modify how they recirculate uh, when they are uptaken by a cell, and that leads to increased uh, half-life. And here, for an example, with 1074, if you look at this, is the serum level curve over time after a single infusion, where the lighter blue with the open squares uh, illustrate the decay uh, of, the, of the antibody that is not modified, in contrast to the antibodies that carry these LS modifications. These modifications now have been introduced to the, to the various B, HIV BNABs that are in clinical testing. And across the board, we have seen that they, in fact, increase half-life by about threefold. Uh, and this will um, hopefully allow for administration of uh, the antibodies intravenously even every uh, only twice a year. Um, other modifications that have been have been done to the antibodies are uh, create antibody-like molecules that are able to uh, recognize different epitopes on, in on envelope. And then he here are two that have been in clinical testing for which we have preliminary results. Uh, this is a bispecific molecule that binds to CD4 itself and to the bottom of the envelope trimer. And then this one um, binds to three areas of envelope. And uh, the, the, the two studies have shown today that they have a good safety profile, even though they are not quite uh, natural, occur naturally occurring in antibodies. Um, they, they have demonstrated good pharmacokinetics. Um, and with the bispecific antibody, uh, they have shown and, and shared at Croy earlier the, this year that the antibody did lead to decline in viral load. So, so far, these molecules have looked promising. Uh, and then lastly, in terms of antibody modifications, um, it's the idea of delivering these antibodies not as protein, but as viral vectors, with the idea that you would introduce the sequence for a given BNAB in, in, a, in an um, adeno-associated adeno virus as a vector that would then uh, infect muscle cells and then induce the production, the long-term production of antibodies that would then be in circulation and then could be protective of HIV. Uh, so this is an important study that was carried by, um, by the VRC at NIH, and then it, it proves the concept that this type of tool could become successful in, in inducing HIV BNABs. Here it's showing um, the concentration of antibody of protein that has been produced after the delivery of the, the viral vector in, in uh, healthy volunteers. Uh, and then it shows that uh, serum levels were maintained over a sustained period of time here um, over uh, a year. Um, and even though these levels were relatively low compared to the, what we can transfer 
um, uh, as protein, uh, it, is, it is a success compared to studies that have happened um, earlier. And the idea these vectors could be optimized to bring these levels uh, to even higher. So, um, and how about, so I showed that when these antibodies were given during ongoing viremia, they led to a period of uh, declining viremia that was followed by rebound, even when three antibodies were given. So in parallel to that, we asked the question, well, how about if we use antibodies uh, in individuals that had achieved suppression with ART, and now what we ask from the antibodies is to maintain suppression. So as all of you know, in the majority of individuals that have been treated with ART, uh, we, they would experience viral rebound, the majority of them, within two to three weeks after, re, after ART is discontinued, which is illustrated in the, this graph here. So we've done, uh, we and others have done studies where we enrolled individuals that had been virologically suppressed on ART, and then they received one, three, or even seven infusions of one or a combination of antibodies over time, and then discontinued ART, and we monitor to see if we could maintain suppression. And in this first study, what we see show here in this Kaplan-Meier curve is with a single antibody, we are able to maintain suppression for, for an average time of about eight weeks in comparison to just discontinued ART, which is the black line. But rebound was uh, occurred, and then there was selection of resistance to the single antibody. Since then, um, we and, and collaborators have expanded on this and tested a combination of two antibodies. Um, in this case, 1074 and 3DNC that bind to the CD4 binding site and, and V3 loop. And then the studies had very similar design where individuals had been on ART, they come into the study and then they receive the antibodies. And for this, we'll focus just on this uh, first group here, group one, where they receive the antibodies as they discontinue the ART. And then the study that was done by the intramural group uh, by Mike Sneller and Taewok Chun at NIH, they follow the same uh, design with the difference being that in their study, the participants had initiated ART during primary infection. And what we find in these two Kaplan-Meier curves is that we were able to maintain suppression for a longer period of time here in the green curve in comparison to the blue curve, which was a shorter study that we had done earlier, as long as the participants had sensitive, sensitive viruses to begin with, and the, the antibodies were maintained, the dosing of the antibodies was uh, maintained. Not everyone uh, was successfully maintaining suppression because there was a, a level of, of uh, baseline resistance uh, in both, uh, both of these studies. Um, so, you know, resistance to baseline resistance to the antibodies is something that I, I keep uh, going back and referring to. And it, it is one of the current, the main challenge, in my opinion, of the strategy overall. Um, so, an alternative way to think about this is, you know, what about if these antibodies are then combined with long-acting ARVs that are in development? Could we then achieve enough breadth to be successful in maintaining suppression? And um, there are two ongoing studies uh, that are testing this concept. These are switch studies um, where um, in one, the uh, participants are transitioning from their ART regimen to receiving a, a combination of the of lenacaparir in combination with these two antibodies. And in another one that is being conducted by the ACTG, they receive long-acting cabotegravir with VRCO7. And we expect that we will learn about these studies uh, probably early next year. So just to summarize this part, what we have we learned so far is that um, a combination of antibodies can maintain virus suppression. However, reservoir diversity is a challenge uh, because we have seen resistance. Um, there is a lot of work on, uh, ongoing in improving uh, sensitivity testing methods that could be then perhaps used as a parallel diagnostic to, the, to select the antibodies for, for different uh, patient populations. Um, however, the antibodies do carry advantages. They, um, they're uh, favorable safety profile. They do not carry uh, the risk of, of selecting for ARV resistance um, as they decay. And they have very long half-lives. They could perhaps be good pairing for long-acting ARVs in development. Looking forward, we, we are expecting results from these studies that combine long-acting ARVs with long-acting BNABs. Um, there are other BNAB combinations that are being tested, including other uh, three BNAB combinations, um, this, the tri, bi and tri-specific molecules that I talked to. And of course, there's always uh, ongoing discovery for uh, near, newer BNABs.
So the last part is about you know the third area where antibodies could come could be um, used perhaps is um, in uh, treatment free remission. And here the idea is that is the the fact that antibodies differ from ARVs in that they carry FC effector functions. And what that means is that through the bottom of the the antibody, the FC domain, they can uh, ident they can bind to envelope that is expressed on the surface of infected cells, and by doing so, engage with other arms of the immune system to mediate clearance or killing of these cells. By forming immune complexes with circulating envelope, for example, they can enhance antigen presentation, and then doing that enhance um, immune responses against HIV. So they have potentially these re the reservoir targeting and immune enhancement properties. What do we know in terms of these potential effects from clinical studies so far? Do, can they really affect the reservoir or host immune responses? And we have some indication that this may be happening to some, to some degree. Uh, in the study that, that I showed to you uh, with the two antibodies over a period of six months, we measured the reservoir, so the pool of cells containing intact HIV proviruses. Um, and here, these two graphs are showing um, the change in number of proviruses before the BNAB treatment and then six months later in comparison to a parallel cohort that was just maintained on the ART. And then there was a, a, a significant, a statistically significant change in the number of proviruses, although this was relatively small and did not lead to uh, eventual control because the, the, we saw a viral rebound. But it's a proof of concept if we if we are able to replicate in, in, in repeat studies um, that the antibodies may in fact be interfering in the reservoir in a way that ARVs cannot do. And similarly, in another study, we looked at effects on T-cell immune responses. And here we are looking at uh, CD8 T cell responses against HIV GAG uh, or CD4 responses. And what you see overall is that there is this, a period uh, after antibody administration where you see an increase in the number of CD4 and CD8 T cells. Um, again, different from what we had seen in ART treatment only, but not sufficient yet to lead to long-term control. Um, so, so then comes the, the question comes, so, so maybe antibodies alone will not be able to, to mediate control. Uh, and then it, this is possibly true. And that's why there is an interest in potentially combining antibodies with all these other interventions like vaccines, even CAR T cells, um, immunomodulatory um, agents, um, to create these, the combination, combination immunotherapies uh, with the goal of limiting the size of the reservoir if these, these um, strategies are administered at ART start um, or after a period or, or they administer doing ART suppression uh, or after ART is discontinued to reduce or control the reservoir. And ultimately what we would like to see is that after ART is discontinued, rather than having this fast and high uh, viral rebound that we would expect normally, we would either maintain entire control or have a period of, of some viral rebound that would then be subsequently controlled because we affected the reservoir or modulated immune responses sufficiently. Um, but there are many things that, that we still don't know. There's promising results from non-human primate studies, but the clinical trials of cure strategies are, are in their very early days. Uh, we have to learn what's the best timing for cure interventions, if the interventions will be more effective doing ART suppression or in the absence of ART, how long these interventions have to be, or even what's our definition of control and how we need to monitor uh, participants that achieve control over time. Uh, I think this is towards the end of my presentation. This is a study that was completed by a group of investigators in, in Denmark, where um, they enrolled individuals that had been on ART suppressing uh, viremia, and they, sorry, I'll take it back. These were ART naive individuals, and they were enrolled in one of four groups in this study where they either uh, just started ART or they received ART and uh, antibody together or they receive ART with romadepsin, which is a, is a drug that has been shown to be able to reverse HIV latency, or they receive the combination of antibody plus romadepsin. And after this period of intervention, one year later, they discontinued ART and they are monitored for viral rebound. And then again, here we see indications that the antibody 
that in now in the context of ART initiation led to modifications of uh, CD8 T cell responses, where in the group that had sensitive viruses to the antibody, uh, unlike the ART only group, we saw that CD8 T cell responses against HIV were maintained at a higher level even after a year of treatment and right prior to. Uh, ART discontinuation. And finally, when they discontinued ART, this is showing uh, viral load curves over time after ART was discontinued. Uh, in red, um, it's showing the individuals that had resistance to the antibodies. So they, they rebound as we would have expected, a rapid uh, peak viremia and then rapid uh, rebound. And this is in contrast to the blue curves where even though the virus did rebound, it was delayed. And then the, the kinetics of rebound were also different, suggesting that even though this was not entirely successful because this, this wouldn't be clinically uh, sufficient, um, but perhaps the modification in immune responses that happened during, given the early intervention led to this modification of viral rebound kinetics. So there are many, many studies that are in development, and you don't need to, we don't need to go through all of this, but this is just to illustrate that there are antibodies that are studies looking at antibodies alone or in combination with other drugs at ART initiation um, or during ART suppression. Um, with different uh, immunomodulatory uh, um, drugs and being led by different groups. Lastly, um, there is an interest in BNABs also from the pediatric field. Uh, several studies have been completed that have shown um, safety and, and also started to establish the pharmacokinetics of different antibodies in pediatric populations. Uh, there's also a study that was um, done in, in kids that had started uh, ART very early after uh, birth, and they were switched over to a combination of antibodies, and then it showed that the antibodies could maintain suppression in um, about half of these um, children. So these, so there is an interest in intervening during this period of time for since uh, immune responses are still evolving. Uh, and these early studies really uh, provide a framework to build upon uh, these types of studies across the age spectrum. So with that, uh, we have uh, promising results in non-human primate studies. Uh, in clinical studies, we have early data that suggests that antibodies may in fact impact the, the viral reservoir and uh, immune responses. It is possible that interventions at ART initiation may have a greater impact in the course of HIV infection. And um, as I showed, there are um, new molecules, new combinations that are in development and that are in clinical testing now. So I expect that in the next two years or so, we're going to be learning, seeing the results from all of those studies that I just uh, showed very quickly here. And with that, I would just like to thank um, our, my many collaborators and funders. Um, I work also here at the Rockefeller University with Michelle Nussen's Lives Group, and we have had the pleasure to collaborate with many investigators across, across the globe. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kasky, for a, a really elegant and thorough discussion of the promise of broadly neutralizing antibodies. The, there are a number of questions in the audience, and I think we'll move right to those. And maybe I'll start us off with just a little bit more background. Um, some of our audience uh, may have been a bit confused by some of the terminology and wondered if you could explain in a little bit more detail what's meant by bispecific and tri-specific broadly neutralizing antibodies. Right. So, so, um, so bispecific and tri-specific means if you if you um, remember when um, I showed. Let me just pull up the slides. Um, Let me see if I can do it like this. Oh. So here, this um, this uh, cartoon here shows the different areas of HIV envelope um, that can be targeted, that the antibodies can bind to. Um, similar to SARS-CoV-2, the antibody combinations that we are using, they bind to, um, to the 
um, to the RBD in different areas of that um, antigen. So bispecific means that the antibody, so the Y, the open Y part of the of the antibody is able to uh, recognize two areas of the envelope. It doesn't mean that it's going to be on the same envelope. It may be that you have a, a, a viral, a virus particle and then the antibody one side of the of the antibody is able to recognize for example um this this orange area of envelope and then it binds to the virus that way and then it binds to uh it, the the top part of of the antibody of the of the virus with the other arm of the of the antibody so um so that's what so that would be bispecific. Tri-specific is it's the same thing, just that there is a possibility that that antibody-like molecule can recognize three different areas of the envelope. So the advantage of that is that we um, then with a single product, we are able to increase its breadth because now it's it's it would be um, the same as having two different antibodies being administered. Rather, you have just a single antibody that has the potential to recognize the virus from two, two different angles. Great, thank you. I think that was very clear. Um, there was are quite a few questions about resistance, as you might imagine. So as that is one of the Achilles heels of broadly neutralizing antibody strategies. So I'm gonna to try to summarize some of the questions in two different areas so that we can get to uh, a broader discussion. So first of all, you mentioned that broadly neutralizing antibodies do not select for resistance to antiretroviral drugs. I think that makes sense. But do they select for resistance to themselves? For example, if you're using a broadly neutralizing antibody, you show data that pretty clearly suggests that they select resistance to themselves. Is that correct? Yes. So, so in terms of the resistance to the ARVs, um, that is true with the ARVs that we have currently. It may be that if if ARVs they're going to go in in you know in, in clinical practice, if they are targeting the envelope in in a similar fashion, it may be that at one point there could be this problem. But currently, that doesn't exist, which is great because we are not uh, limiting options for, for patients by administering the antibodies. Um, there is a selection of resistance to the antibodies, so that is true. Uh, what we, we have seen is that most of the resistance that is being selected is resistance that has already been archived. So it's not, at least for the studies so far, it seems that it's not that the resistance is evolving during the, the clinical trial, but rather uh, the, this is resistant viruses that had been you know, dormant in the pool of viruses that remain in CD4 T cells despite, despite ARV. And it's a reflection of the fact that antibodies, unlike ARVs, are products that, that any, anyone with HIV uh, will develop over time as they, um, their immune system fight over the evolution of the virus. Great. Um, another aspect of the resistance had to do with pre-existing resistance and the emergence of resistance on therapy. I think you've explained the emergence of resistance on therapy. Is it what is the concept behind pre-existing resistance? Is that just the natural evolution of a constantly evolving? Right. So, so, so we think that it, that mostly it's it, we are selecting pre-existing resistance. So we are selecting so viruses that are sensitive and that try to emerge from from the reservoir from infected cells. Once you remove ART, they are being killed and eliminated by the antibodies. The the viruses that that were resistant to begin with, they are the ones that are that break through the antibodies because they are resistant. And this is a result of um, the person's own antibodies have selected. So even if someone doesn't have in their bodies a 3BNC type of BNAB, but they may have a combination of antibodies that 
that cause the same effect on the virus. So the virus is constantly, before we, we shut viral replication down with ARV, the virus is always trying to escape and modifying itself against the immune response. So envelope is a protein that can diversify uh, and the virus continues to be infectious. And then we will do that as far as the immune system tries to push it. Once someone starts ARVs and then the viral replication is suppressed, then those viruses that evolved over time are archived. Once ARVs are removed, then there is an opportunity for these viruses to emerge from this archive. And then some of them may then be uh, resistant to the antibodies that we are giving because they evolved in the presence of the person's own antibodies. Great. I think um, many in our audience are, are uh, familiar with the concept of archived resistance right. mutations. So I think this uh, goes along with what we know about that. Um, so let me move on to a different topic. One, I think most of uh, the studies that you discussed are broadly neutralizing antibodies that are administered by infusion. Are there any other routes of administration that are being tested with broadly neutralizing antibodies? Yes, yeah, so subcutaneous administration um, is being tested, uh, particularly now that, that we have data with these LS uh, long-acting antibodies. So uh, it seems possible that we would be able to administer subcutaneously high enough doses uh, to maintain antibody levels that are sufficient to prevent or maintain suppression if we were to administer, for example, every three months or so. So, so the two routes that are being pursued right now are, are intravenous or subcutaneous. Great. Thank you. Um, so there's another question about the significance of defective proviral, proviral DNA. Um, can you explain that concept a little bit? You know, that's an, that's an interesting question. So defective viruses um, will, so in, in this archive of the reservoir, the majority of what's archived are viruses that are defective. And that, what that means is that, that those viruses are not going to be able to induce viremia. Again, so so if you have a reservoir that is only of defective viruses, you can discontinue ART and you're not going to have a viral load rebound. However, some of these defective viruses, even though they may not lead to a production of a full virion that can go on and infect a new cell, they may still produce some viral proteins. And then by doing so, it may still trigger the immune system to respond to it. So, so these viruses may be active as far as the immune system goes in, in inducing activity of the immune system. So it may be that they, and this is not really known, if the chronic inflammation that characterizes HIV, if the defective viruses are important in, in, in continuing that process. Um, so, you know, when we are talking about um, suppress or remission or long-term uh, treatment-free suppression of HIV. The focus is most is entirely, quite frankly, on maintaining virus suppression. But we don't know if the defectives that we need to address the defectives also, depending on what this defective pool is and how immunologically triggering this pool of defective viruses are. But so, so it is an interesting question that we don't really know how to deal with yet. Great. Thank you for that. Um, another question is about other safety concerns, not just immediate concerns after the infusion, but things like autoimmunity, cytokine release, antibody dependent enhancement or immune complex formation that may affect viral clearance or viral suppression. Right, so, so antibody enhancement, which is something that is of concern, for example, with dengue, it's, it's not, um, it hasn't been described it had, uh, with HIV, at least in in vivo um, studies. Um, immune complexes um, was something that we were concerned, particularly when we were administering the antibodies in individuals that had ongoing viremia. So there was a, a likelihood of a lot of immune complex formation and it's something that is important in hepatitis B, for example, but we have not seen, and we follow participants closely for that 
but we haven't seen uh, any immune complex like disease or laboratory changes that would suggest that um, autoimmunity, um, not necessarily autoimmunity, but one thing that is a possibility is that um, the immune system would uh, produce anti antibody, uh, antibody, anti BNAB antibody responses, which is something that is real and happens in with antibodies for rheumatologic diseases, for example. Uh, and what we have seen, we and the other groups working with BNABs so far, is that some individuals do build a, an anti BNAB antibody response, but for the most part, these have been transient and they have not been associ associated with either adver clinical adverse events, laboratory changes, or with uh, changes in the pharmacokinetics of the antibodies. Because one thing that is important about the majority of these antibodies is that they are human antibodies. So, they, so, so the likelihood of these types of immunologic type responses is lower. Um, but that's one of the things that is of concern, for example, when we are thinking about bispecific and tri-specific or, or vector delivery of antibodies, because then we are getting further away from a, a human like a human protein. Um, and it's been one of the challenges with vector delivery of antibodies because they they do they are known to induce these antibody responses that then lead to clearance of the antibody of interest very quickly. So with the passive immunization of human BNAMs, it hasn't been a problem. With viral vectors, it has been a problem. Uh, with the engineered antibodies so far, it doesn't seem to be a problem, but, it, but the studies are still early. Great, thank you. There's a number of questions. I think you sort of answered this already with the suggestion that this might be possible, but thus far, have there been any uh, known interactions with antivirals that bind other aspects of the HIV envelope like CCR5 antagonists? Right. So when when we started, uh, we were asked by the, the FDA specifically to look at uh, entry inhibitors and CCR5 um, uh, antagonists. And, and we did at least in vitro, we did not find any any interaction in either direction that resistance to our BNAB would interfere with the activity of the other drugs or vice versa. So so it doesn't seem to be a problem. Great. Thank you. And we're getting down to the wire here. So I'm just going to finish with one additional question should be quick to answer and any additional questions you all have. We will be following up after the conference to uh, get those answered for you in writing. So the, the question I'm going to ask is, are BNABs being studied for post-exposure prevention of HIV? So th this is one um, area that, that, it, that it has uh, potential. Um, I'm not aware of any study that is looking at, the, uh, that is testing this clinical scenario specifically, but it is, it is in the umbrella of, of possibilities for, for the BNABs for sure. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'll just finish by uh, summarizing a couple of different other questions or comment on a couple of the questions. Me several members of the audience asked about referring patients to clinical trials of BNAB therapies. And you're, you had one big summary slide about different studies that are underway, both for cure, potentially for cure or alteration of the reservoir, as well as other studies for therapies. And I'll just refer the audience to your syllabus to look at that slide. And then you will likely be able to follow, find many of these on um, clinicaltrials.gov website if you want to know. And where anyone, you're... feel free to email me. I'm, I'm happy to direct right. you depending on where you are. Thank you. All right. I'm going to turn the program back over to Dr. Volverding, who's going to introduce our next speaker and thank Dr. Kasky for a wonderful presentation.